So first of all, welcome, Dr. Miraj. We're Thank you. Thank you for having me. You. I appreciate it. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's, uh, well, first, started. I just want to thank you for having me on, uh, Fahad, and the whole Iqra team. You know, last week we had a little scheduling snafu. And then in the middle of the week, someone else did to me what I did to you with a scheduling snafu. And I was I had to be very gracious with them because you were so gracious with me last week. And so mm -hmm. I was able to pay it forward a little bit. So thank you for teaching me that lesson. <laughs> so, um, but uh yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, so my name is Miraj Mohideen. I'm, I'm here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the United States of America. Uh, real quickly, my parents uh, are immigrants from India, from Hyderabad, India, uh, moved here in the 70s. I grew up, uh, I was born and raised in America. So that's kind of the culture that I know the best. Uh, and um, my background was basically, you know, I have an older brother, younger sister. We grew up in a mostly, uh, we didn't have a very strong Muslim community around us. So we were American children who are raised with a strong emphasis on Islam and education, mm -hmm. uh, but with a very immigrant mentality, American immigrant mentality. But I've always, you know, I've lived here my whole life. I, uh, and so I feel very comfortable uh, here in America in many ways. There are obviously challenges of living here, but, um, you know, I'm very attuned to the challenges that I had and that my peers have had growing up in America. And, you know, we'll talk about, you know, the, the challenges and the opportunities. I think there are actually a lot of opportunities of growing up in, in, uh, in a place like this. So that's wonderful. What, uh, one of the I lived in Arizona for some time, so I know uh, that state very well. And it's um, uh, there's a lot of I read in your biography that you like hiking. So that was one of the reasons why you uh, went there. Yes. Yeah. 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 So so, so. I, I think it's a good place to raise a family. Um, yes. So, so tell me a little bit about your book. You so much. I love this is a, a fantastic book. Uh, yeah. Great reviews on okay. Amazon, by the way. And uh, so give us a little bit of background. What is that book about? So essentially, uh, you know, Revelation, uh, which is right here, this book right here, it's basically, it's the seerah. It's the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But, you know, uh, what you have to realize is that, you know, Sira, uh, Sira is the story of his life, right? And every time, you know, you would, he, there's no one who is, there's no more, there's no person who has more written about him than the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that's just the, the blessing, right? And Allah says this in the Quran that we will raise a remembrance. And it's, yep. that's the miracle of the Quran. It was, it was, you know, stated very early in the Quranic, uh, in Surah Al-Duha, that we will raise your remembrance. And now we are, everyone right now is talking about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And not only do we talk about a lot, we know the most about him. Because yeah. a lot of Christians talk about Jesus, Christ, peace be upon him. But they probably know, only know less than a page of actually what happened in his life. And we have volumes and volumes of material. So every, every generation, we have books. So the question is, why do you need a new book of Sira? If it's already, you know, we have a book of Sira, is it getting more authentic? Is it getting this and that? And the reality is when I studied different Sira's over time, every time you write a biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, whether you like it or not, you are writing for the needs of your people. Uh, so it's not just that the story, the story stays the same, but your focus may change through the eras because certain things are important to certain people at a certain time. So a classic example is in the earliest siras, there's a lot of emphasis on the maghazi or the, the expeditions and what happened in this battle and stuff like that. In this day and age, no one really is that concerned about that because that's not a day-to-day -day issue for us. So we don't really derive that much, uh, you know, that many lessons out of it. Um, and so we tend to need to have other needs. And so what I, what I realized for myself when I was studying Sira, there was not one single book that was giving me what I needed. Like I would have to read like 10 different books to get a little bit of, oh, there's an emphasis on, on battles here. This one has an emphasis on his personal life. This one has an emphasis on this and so forth. And me as someone uh, born in the 20th into the 21st century, 
I just felt like the books I was reading was not exactly like the books I'm used to reading and studying and learning from on all other topics that I've become very good at. So it was born out of a revelation was born out of a need. I didn't, you know, when I started uh, like, uh, I think in 2003, about 15, 16 years ago, I started this journey. I was just trying to learn about the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. Uh, and we'll get into why I did that and so forth. But I was just trying to learn his life. And so I was reading books and I was taking notes. What happened over 15 years is I realized, wow, I have a collection of notes that if you put this together, this doesn't exist in all these other books. And if it's helpful to me, maybe it'll be helpful to my brother and my sister. And then it went, well, maybe it's helpful for my cousins. And then maybe it's helpful to my friends. And the next thing you know, uh, I guess it was helpful to a lot of people because a lot of people, you know, are like me. We're born into this time and we need the Sira explained and presented in a way that can actually have a meaningful impact on our lives. So that's kind of the genesis of Revelation. Okay. So, so, so what, what I'm hearing is that what, what inspired you to write this book is really the fact that uh, there's a disconnect between the kind of classical uh, Sira books and that's kind of a completely con a contemporary way of presenting the Sira. Is, is that a, an accurate description or? Yeah, I think that's an accurate description. And I think that's really important. See, because one thing that I will say, and I've encountered this in my journey, is that people are like, oh, is, is the traditional text not good enough for you? Are you reinterpreting this stuff? And that's obviously, you have people who have very, their, their bid'ah radar and their reinterpretation radar, those words are very dangerous. And they should be. We should be very careful about that stuff. But to say that I don't get moved by a classical text doesn't mean that there was something wrong with the classical text. It just means that they're in a different time. If you gave Imam al-Ghazali something from a different time, he might not be as moved by it, by something that's more meaningful to him in the language and in the ideas that he's thinking in. So it has nothing to do with saying, oh, this is not good enough or this. It's just, it's not as, uh, you know, meaningful to me. And I think the most important thing is that we definitely stick to the authenticity of the tradition, but we make it in a language of the people, which is what the Quran says about all the prophets. It spoke in the language of the people. It wasn't some high, unique language of Arabic. The Quran is beautiful because that's the language they were speaking in. The, the Arabic has changed now. So that's why Arabic speakers can't understand the Quran. So we have, we have this imperative to always give the message in the language that the people are speaking. And so to me, that's just what revelation is. It's in the language of a Western, not even a Western, a modern minded person who needs to see things in figures and charts and diagrams and in color. You know, people don't really study that much from just black and white text where you're listing out, you know, this is Abdullah ibn this, ibn this, ibn this, ibn this, because we're, our mind isn't attuned to genealogy the way it was for the previous generations, but we need maps and figures and we need new things to make this material, like to bring it into our heart. And so that's kind of what revelation is. Okay. Um, very interesting. Uh, one, of the, one thing that comes to mind is um, in our Facebook page for Iqra Network, one of the best performing uh, posts that we had was actually the description. Um, that there's a hadith by Umm Ma'bid uh, or a, a description of the prophets, the physical attributes of Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. alayhi salatu And it was one of the mo best performing uh, posts that we ever had. So we have a lot of our community have this intrinsic love to Prophet Muhammad uh, yes. Yet yes. I think uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad ha has been absent from our homes. Do you believe that this is the case? And, uh, and why? why? Why is that happening? He's not as present as he should be in our daily lives. Is yes. that the case? Yes. Are you trying to bridge that gap somehow? So I'm glad you asked that. And I'm glad we're talking about this early because I want to spend more time on this than anything else. Um, speaking from my own experience, so I'm not trying to label anyone else and their experience or their relationship with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Nice. It's my experience that most, most Muslims do not love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the way they think they do. They don't love the Prophet, peace be upon him, the way they are expected to love him or commanded to love him. And this is something that I didn't know because I thought I loved the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then, you, you know, you can quantify, well, what does love mean? Who are you to decide what love means and so forth, how much I love and so forth? Well, there's actually metrics to quantify love. You know, believe it or not, you can judge your level of love, okay? Yeah. Because you can look at your own children and judge it, right? 
because you know there's a, a scholar who I really like a lot, and he said, uh, you know, the the word love comes in the Quran over ninety times. And Allah does not describe what love is. He describes the very first manifestation of love. And the very first manifestation of love is being committed to something. So if you love someone, you're very committed because you just don't know how to be any other way. But, to, you know, if my father asked me to do something, I'll say, Abba, of course, whatever you want. You want me to go here? I'll do this, whatever you want. If my mother asked me to do something, I won't even like put in the equation, oh, it's not worth my time. It's a headache. It's out of love. Your commitment shows proves your love. And if you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, you can see the companions in their gradation based on their level of commitment. Whoever was doing the most was doing it out of a sense of love. They wanted to be the closest to him. So it was commitment. It wasn't tears, right? It wasn't, te- I don't think of many, I can't think of many examples where, the, where Sayyidina Abu Bakr cried out of remembrance to the Prophet. In fact, at the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, Sayyidina Abu Bakr maintained the most level-mindedness, while everyone else was overwhelmed with emotion. Because it was his commitment that actually proved his love more than the tears and the emotion. And not that the tears and the emotion are important, but you know, I, you know, Fahad, I always use this analogy, and I think this will just make it very simple for people, is that, um, you know, and I'll use my, my grandfather as an example. You know, if you ask me if I love my grandfather, I would tell you, absolutely, I love my grandfather. Like, how could I not love my grandfather? And then if you ask me if I love my father, I'll say, of course. Now, who's, now, which love of mine is stronger, for my father or for my grandfather? The reality is the love for my father is much stronger because I know my father so well. The reason why I love my grandfather, when I really sat down and thought about this, is I love my grandfather because my father loved him. Mm-hmm. Not because I really knew my grandfather that well. So what I'm trying to say is in my family, there's a culture of loving my grandfather created by my father and my mother, all my grandparents. And because of that, I'm in that culture. So of course we love our dada or our nana or whatever you call your, your grandparent. But your true knowledge is based on your knowledge of that person and your direct connection to them, not through another person. And it's my belief that in our Islamic community, you know, we have all these beautiful things like nasheed and songs about the prophet and salawat and all this kind of stuff. There's a culture of loving the prophet, peace be upon him. So we quickly say, oh, I love the prophet. I love the prophet, let's the Islam. But it's like, well, you can't really truly know, love him if you don't know what he did for you, what he sacrificed for you, what exactly were the, at stake that he made dua for you. When he was thinking about you, he was burning his own children, and yet he was thinking about the community, not his community, but us in the 21st century making dua for us. If you truly understand the sacrifices he made, the same way I know the sacrifices that my father made for me, I will love him like my father, I will love him more than my father. I, he's done way more for me than my father has ever done. And my mother has ever done for me. And I love them infinitely. Yeah, so all I'm just saying is that it's easy to say that you love someone. Like I can say I love my grandfather and I do love my grandfather. But the reality is that love is more because I was surrounded by a culture of loving my grandfather. So you wouldn't know what else to do but to love your grandfather because those that you love, love that person. And that's how many of us are with the Prophet, Islam, the people who we respect, admire, the Imam, Iqra Network, they all give us these messages of loving the Prophet, loving the Prophet. So we don't know any other way to be than to love the Prophet. We don't hate him. We don't, we don't have, we're not neutral about him. We like him. So then we say, oh, we love him. So we're in that group. But my just point is that you don't really love him the way it was meant to be said, which is that you have to know him so well and feel connected to him that you actually, you know, the famous the interaction between him and Sayyidina Umar about you don't truly love the Prophet peace be upon, until you love him more than you love yourself. That's hard. Most of us don't love the prophet more than we love our spouse or our parents. The reality, because we're talking about commitment. We said commitment equals love. So if you're more committed to your, your family than you are to the prophet, peace upon him, or to someone else, then you don't truly love him the way he was meant to be loved. And so a lot of my uh, messaging is all about how do we move people from A to B, about transformation. That's what I'm about. I'm not so much about information. It's good to know a lot. and be, We don't need to become scholars. There's unnecessary emphasis on making lay people scholars. No one needs to become a scholar except for people who want to become scholars. The rest of us lay Muslims just need to move from A to B. B A is where you're kind of just going with the flow. B is when you are committed and you are, you are transformed and alive by the example of the Prophet and the relationship that you have with him, the very real relationship. So that's what I'm very uh, focused on with Revelation. Okay. So... Um... So as we mentioned that Prophet Muhammad there is this love, but actually it, 
we, 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 it doesn't translate into action necessarily in our homes. So from your yeah. perspective, what is a quick recipe for families and especially younger families to, yes. establish, to establish Prophet Muhammad as the example, the role model yes. in their homes? Yes. What are yes. some tips? How can we get there? Okay, so there's only one tip. I wish I could give you like a one, two, three. People like to do, you know, one, two, three. There's only one tip to making, okay, to, as a parent, I'll speak to other parents who are listening around. To get your kids to feel connected to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I only have one tip for you. Okay. Okay, and most people all want years. to hear easier tip. So okay. can, everyone lean in to the camera so you can hear this tip, okay? The only tip that I can give a parent is to you yourself fall in love with the Prophet If That's it. I wish there was some easier thing. Here's this DVD. Here's a video. Sign up at this Zoom class. That's all. That's all when you don't have that direct love to the Prophet. You start looking for what else can I do? Can I buy this widget, this attachment, this app? If you fall as a parent, you have to first own your relationship with the Prophet Muhammad. Peace upon him. You have to Take a moment to be like, where am I at in this journey? Because if I don't have it, why am I expecting a six-year-old to have it? You know, if I'm in my 40s or my 30s and I still haven't developed that, why would I expect a little child to develop that? And so the first thing you have to do is you have to start getting really connected to the Prophet Muhammad. And the easiest way, I think, is just to read about his life. I think it's much easier to connect to the Prophet through the seerah than it is through the hadith or the Quran. Okay, those other two, you need a lot of knowledge and you have to have understanding. Sira is just a story. It's like a storybook. You just read it. You just have to have a heart that's beating. If your heart beats, you'll fall in love with the Prophet. There's no prerequisite to Sira, which is why I love to emphasize Sira for people who are coming to Islam. You just read about the Prophet Muhammad, learn about him, and you will not, you, it's impossible not to fall in love with him. It's impossible if you have a pure heart or even just like a semi-pure heart or even just like a regular heart. Just read it over it, you will find what connects to you. Now, everyone has their different things in the story that connects to them. Some people are more emotional. Some people are more strategic, analytical, whatever it is within the seerah, connect to the prophet. When you're connected to the prophet, peace upon him, then you become committed to him. And what does it mean to be committed to the prophet? It means you start following his example because you look around you're like, there's no one else who's better than him for me to be like as a person, forget about as a father. So now you're committed to the prophet. Now, one of the things that we know about the Prophet Muhammad is that he was the best father and the best husband. Okay, well, if I'm committed to him, I have to be the best father and the best husband. He said, the best of you are those who are the best to their families, and I am the best to my family. Now, if you're com you love the Prophet as a person, you are committed to him, peace be upon him, and now you want to be like him. So this is the next part of that journey. First, you know him, and then that knowledge moves down into the heart. Now there's something going on here. When the heart is connected to the prophet, you get pulled by his example. You want to be, and that's, that's how you know you're going in the right direction. They say that the, the guides of spirituality, they say that the, the way you know that you are going in the right direction is because the things that he did, you want to start doing. And the things that Allah is asking you to do start becoming easier and easier because you don't, you're just done with like compromising. I want to be a little bit this and a little bit Muslim. I want to be a little bit Egyptian and a little bit Muslim, a little bit American, a little bit. No, I just, I just want to be like the prophet. I want to be like my coach. That's it. I'm done playing these games. I, you, every, hopefully, inshallah, we all come to a point in our lives. We have to make this hijrah moment. That's what I call it. This is how I teach revelation. You have to make a hijrah. Either you stay in Mecca or you go to Medina. Either you be an American playing an, or an Egyptian or a nationalist or a tribalist, or you be in the ummah of the prophet, peace be upon him. If you play it both ways, I want to be in Mecca a little bit and in Medina a little bit. You can do that, but you're kind of a straggler. You're not one of the Ansar who is living with the Prophet and who has the highest maqam. And so that's what I, you know, I believe as parents. Because I, you know, I'll talk a lot and people be like, oh, I love your book. I can't wait for my kids to get old enough to read it. And I'm just like, no, 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 that's not the point. You have to read it. It's for you to transform. My ideal that my, my favorite readers are the readers who email me, message me from all over the world. And they'll say, I read this book and now it's making a change in me and my kids are seeing that change in me. That's how you create transformation because that's how the Prophet ﷺ did it, right? People, if you look at his children, right, his children, so we'll say, you know, we'll start with uh, um, uh, uh, Sayyidina Zayd, right? 
I mean, when I say his children, those who were under his care, mm-hmm. Sayyidina and Zayd and Osama and all these yeah. people, yeah. they weren't like, oh, the Prophet Islam gave great lectures. He gave great khutbahs. You, don't, you never hear that. They're just like, I just want to be around him. The things that I've seen from him, the way he treats me, I just want to be around him. And so it's my, I'm convinced that we have to be prophetic to our children. If we are completely gentle, if we are not using force to guide them, if we're using love, love, right? We're using this idea of um, tarbiyah, just gentle guidance. And we are prophetic. They will be so attached to us that they will say, when they go to college and someone says, hey, let's go do uh, X, Y, Z. They'll be like, no, I don't want to leave my father and the way of my father, because he has shown me things that I couldn't, I can't, just like the way Sayyidina Zayd t- spoke about the Prophet Muhammad, Fizwan, it'd be ideal if our children spoke about us that way. And so that's why I tell people it's tough. So now, you know, a lot of parents be like, well, that's a heavy road. I wish you, I wish Dr. Mraj said that there was an app I could download that would help bring the Prophet peace bomb into our house powerfully. And I, and you know, it, that would be nice if we could just download something, but it's just not how it is. You have to do the heavy lifting. You have to become in love with the Prophet peace upon him. But it's the best journey. There's nothing, whatever journey, other journey you're on, I guarantee you it will not be as enjoyable and, and beautiful as the journey of connecting to the Prophet peace be upon him. Because the connection to the Prophet is really connection to the Quran. And we can talk about that in a little bit. But that's what we're talking about here. So I just think there's no tips and tricks. You just need to just connect to the prophecy one and you will naturally, if you're following the coaching advice, become an amazing parent, become an amazing spouse. And that is more important than anything that you can tell your children about the prophet is your own example of the prophet for them. You said something very interesting earlier about your love for your father, that you knew obviously your father and your love for your grandfather was kind of by extension. Yes. Um, so you know your father, obviously, every day you see him, you have all of it. And it seems to me that the path is everyone has, is not doing enough to know Prophet Muhammad. Everyone yeah. is not, they're not reading about uh, his life. They're not reading about his seerah. Yes, we're reading the Quran and all of that, but we're not reading about the living Quran, which is Prophet Muhammad. Yes. So it seems to me that what you're telling us is, we need to learn, we need to purposefully and intentionally start spending more time learning about Prophet Muhammad is that, is that accurate? Uh, for parents, for adults, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that is the way. I think we have to do that. I, and, I, and I think that, you know, when you get into psych, you know, motivation, psychology and so forth, everyone's on a different level in their journey. Some people listening right now might be like, yes, I have to, you're right. I'm going to start now. And some people are not there yet. They're like, oh, I don't know. And, and a lot of that is because people have different experiences of what it means, what the prophet peace of honor means to them. Okay. There are people who are raised in very strict environments with, with not a lot of Rahmah. And they've associated the prophet Muhammad peace of with that emotion because that person was talking about the prophet Muhammad peace of honor a lot. Okay, and we're going kind of going to a different place right now. But the psychological reason why people don't want to go to the Quran, the psychological reasons why people do not connect to the masjid or to their Muslim community or to their Muslim identity or to the Prophet Muhammad, the peace be upon and so forth, is a lot of people have had very difficult experiences in their own lives, which they have now connected to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon or to Islam or to the Quran, not because they're trying to, but because they're human beings. And for a lot of people, you have to be gentle and and moving them in that direction towards the Prophet Muhammad. And I just believe that the best way to do that is for each of us to be imbued by his light. And people realize, oh, there's another example of the Prophet Muhammad in this friend of mine. He's an amazing person. He's gentle. He's always smiling. He calls me and no one else calls me. And I know he's charged by the Prophet Muhammad. I want to know. I want to have what he has. And so... We have to be patient with people with where they're at in their journeys. It's very important. We can't just demand everyone because everyone is coming from different backgrounds, different uh, life experiences. But uh, ideally, I think what we have to do first, before we even teach about the Prophet Muhammad is we have to actually give people a reason for wanting to connect to him. Mm -hmm. And the best way to give people that reason is to be that example, to be prophetic for people. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I, I tell my students and, you know, people all the time, I recognize pretty early on in my career that, for a lot of people, when I speak, I am the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to them. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds kind of weird when you say that, but I'm representing him. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like, Astaghfirullah brothers, this is haram and the, the bid'ah of this and you need, that's, they, they're applying this energy to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon himself. Whether you like it or not, when you do this, this is how they, they, do you see this frowning right here? They superimpose this on their mentality of the Prophet peace be upon him. They're like, oh, this guy is saying he's so charged by the Prophet and look at his face. And yet we know the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him smiled more than anyone else. No one smiled yep. more than the Prophet. Yep. So where is all the smiling? Because mm -hmm. people want to be around beauty. They're naturally attracted to beauty. If you take on his nur, oh, everything, you'll be beautiful and people want to be around that. And so I think we need to just, the more we can be like him through his example, then you'll want to study him. You know, so don't push people to study him without, you know, because people just get forced and then they resent it and that creates a whole other problem. And this gets into childhood education. You know, and this is why I love Iqra Network. This is a totally unsolicited plug right now. Mm -hmm. To me, the most important thing about Iqra Network is not what you teach my child. Mm -hmm. The most important thing about Iqra Network is who is the person teaching my child? Mm -hmm. And do they give my, I have, you know, just for those of you watching, I have a six-year-old becoming seven years old, I think watching right now. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing to me is that the person who is teaching my child, Alhamdulillah, we have that in Sheikh Yusuf, is that he, to me, is uh, his, his nur is prophetic. It is from the community of the Prophet Muhammad peace be Because mm -hmm. right now at six years old, my child, whatever, whatever Sheikh Yusuf does, whether he likes it or not subconsciously, he's imposing that on the, his image of the Prophet Muhammad peace be So we mm -hmm. need to be those examples of the Prophet peace for other people. And we need to be guided by people who have greater nur for us. So. MashaAllah, very, very, very well said. Uh, there is a verse, a beautiful verse in the Quran that says, which means if you had harsh, Allah Azza wa Jal is describing Prophet Muhammad and saying yes. that if you're harsh, if you ha had you been harsh, or they would have left you, even if you have the word of Allah, you. they would have left you. So subhanAllah, uh, the container, the container is so critical, so critical. So it's, it's, um, it's a great point, Dr. Miro. Well, and that's what I always tell people is that the messenger is the biggest message. Yes. Not the message. The messenger yeah. is the message. How you yeah. dress, how you speak, how you smile. Do you lean in when people talk to you? That's more powerful than whatever is going to come out of your mouth after they ask you a question. And yes. that, is, that is the sunnah of the Prophet. Yes, yes, mashallah. So. I, I, I pray that all of us have this character, or at least some of that inshallah. character. It, inshallah. It, it, inshallah. Uh, change the world, inshallah. inshallah. Uh, Dr. Miraj, a great accomplishment, right? Writing this book, a wonderful accomplishment. I can't imagine doing something like that. Now tell me, what was, uh, for you, what was the most challenging aspect of writing this book? I know you don't have a background in Islamic, typical yes. uh, Islamic uh, education, but give me, what, how did you come, how did you write that book? And what was the biggest challenge for you? Uh, so I would say that the biggest, so the book took me about 15 years to write. And that's because I didn't know I was writing a book. I was taking notes for the first five, six years. I was just taking personal notes. I'll share it. I'll email it to my siblings, stuff like that. After about five, six, seven years, then I just realized, wow, this is something that no one has done in this way, in this time, in this age. And if this is helpful to me, I can only imagine be helpful to other people. I think the most challenging thing for me, and you know, most people don't, uh, the, most people don't see the 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 day to day grittiness of anything. You know, they just see the end result. It's all polished and new and shiny. What people don't see is all the heartbreak, all of the literally all of the unsaved documents, the computer crashing that happens. No one sees all this stuff. And I, I'll be totally honest with you. This happened to me two weeks ago or a week ago. I'm I'm doing a video series now to help people connect to the Sira. Uh, on if you just go to revelationthebook.com or the Revelation uh, Experience, I'm starting to bring my book to video and to audio of a podcast. If you go on YouTube, the Revelation Experience, I start working people through this. Uh, we're talking about terabytes of data. I have lost, I have lost two weeks of work. I have lost it, and it's so painful. And so um, you, I've cried over over the challenges of trying to get to the end result. I've cried over this many times. I have stopped and be like, Ya Allah, are you sending me a message that you don't want me to do this? Because 
this has to be divine. That the catastrophe, that the disaster that just happened, either you're telling me that you don't want this to happen or you're challenging me to see if I will overcome this. This is one of two things. Okay. And one thing that I will say, and this is really important, and this is how I teach revelation and the Sira, which I think is unique to how I've ever heard it before is that you, uh, once you start getting the details of the prophet's life, and I'll lay this out in my, uh, in my series, um, you have to look at the prophet's life, peace be upon him as a journey. Okay. He was 20, he, his journey was 23 years from Iqra to the end, to his death. It was 23 years to deliver the Quran. It was not all roses. It was actually less roses, more struggle and, tr and hardship, more crushing defeats, more crushing disappointments. Uh, the most crushing, one of the most crushing disappointments and challenges in his life was the death of his wife, Sayyidina Khadija. If you're talking about a hard drive failure, that's the most crushing. And then Sayyidina Abu Talib, and then what happened at Taif, and then the challenges at, uh, at Uhud. Like throughout, you have an up, then you have a down, then you have an up, then you have a down. And what I tell people is that you have to look at his life as a roadmap. Hmm. Because you have to go on your own roadmap. And if you follow the sunnah, see, when we talk about following the sunnah, we always talk about, oh, brother, grow the beard, wear this. And I all think that's, that's okay, but it's all superficial sunnah. The real sunnah to me, the powerful sunnahs of life changing transformation is, is your life journey mimicking his life journey. I'm never going to, you know, I live in Phoenix because it looks like Medina. That's one of the reasons why I live here. But aside from that, I'm never riding a camel anywhere. I'm never doing the vast majority of the superficial things the Prophet Peace of did. But the true sunnahs to me is that when you get a crushing defeat, you have to turn to Allah the way he did a taif and be like, Ya Allah, if you're doing this to me for, for your pleasure, whatever you do, I am pleased with your pleasure. But if I have to do something, I want to pick myself up and keep pushing. Because if you're testing me to see if I can overcome, I will overcome. Until you kill me, until you take my soul, my life from me, I will continue to crawl towards you. And that's the sunnah of the prophet. That's the sunnah of the ashara mubashirin, of the companions, is that they just, they lost it all and then they gave up more. They lost it all, they gave up more. So hard drives, failures, this and that. So whenever I had these moments myself, I had one a week ago and I was crushed. I had to call my wife and I was almost crying because like how many failures can I go through? How many erasures? How many pitfalls? You know, I, I translated a, a whole Quran, over 400 verses of Quran. I typed it in and then for whatever reason, my relationship with that translator, it, it fell apart and I had to redo the whole thing with another thing. And what I found for myself is that I tell myself the story that the reason why Allah is choosing me to do this is because I will prove to him that I will overcome whatever he puts in my way. So it's not a hardship, it's a test. And when you look at the examples of the prophets, what you see is that that's, they had the hardest lives. See, we tend to look at the, oh, Allah, why do you do this to me? Why did you, why was I born into this community? Why didn't you give me more money? I could have done this. Why didn't you do this? And what we don't realize is that the, he tests the ones he loves the most because he's giving us more opportunities to prove our love to him. And so that's what I, I've learned. It's not easy. I'm not going to pretend like, oh, it gets easy. And it's, it's still challenging. If you look at Surah Al-Ahzab, the companions who have been with the Prophet peace be upon for 18 years, they're still, they're having thoughts in their head about Allah. That's what Surah Hazab says. How could the companions be having thoughts in their head about Allah, like kind of strange thoughts? Because it's so difficult. The, the tremendous burden of the challenge, can they rise to the cage or not? They themselves are like, are they giving up on Allah? Allah, I've given you 18 years of my life. Now you're going to let these people crush us? Where are you, Allah? I thought you were with us. You promised us in all these surahs. Now where are you? They're having thoughts about Allah. This is life. And this is how the sirah becomes important. Because if you can harness the power of picking yourself up and continuing to move, like, like Yusuf al Islam, we have the whole story up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. But in the end, what happens? He has his homecoming where the family comes and the dream comes true. Yeah. And in the same way, in the end of the life of the Prophet, Muhammad, same homecoming at, at, at the Kaaba, he says, in the words of Yusuf, he says the same thing. There's no, there's no fear upon you today. Today's a day of Rahmah. So you see all of these prophets follow the same story, up, down, up, down. But the up, down, it goes up, down, but it's slowly going like this up. 
it's like the stock market. You know, you don't just sell on when it goes down. You go up, you go up, down, up, down. But as long as the trajectory, Allah is lifting you up because you don't give up. I mean, like, you know, it blows my mind that Yusuf al-Islam told these people, hey, don't forget about mentioning me to the king. And then they forgot. Like, that's worse than a hard drive failure. Because of that one slip, they forgot. He has to sit for so many more years in prison. He doesn't turn on Allah and says, yeah, Allah, you, you know, ah, I gave you all my life and now you made that guy forget. That's just a test from him. And then what happens? He passes that test, homecoming. So we're all looking for our homecoming, you know, inshallah. And that's, this is how I teach our revelations, that you have to make your life prophetic. And inshallah, if you do, that's the sunnah. That's the truest sunnah of the prophets, to follow their sunnah, is to follow their life example, their, their life map. So You, you mentioned um, how... You uh, it's 23 years, uh, the birth of the Prophet والسلام, And I remember in your book, a beautiful representation, illustration of the 23 yes. years. And what, what's, uh, what struck me about your book is actually the, the, how you laid out, you, ha you had very interesting illustrations throughout the book. Mm -hmm. and I thought mm -hmm. that, was, uh, that was very clever and very unique. Uh, how did you... Uh, how did that, that, that come about, basically, those illustrations? And, and um, uh, I, th I think it, it's, it's uh, one of the things that I thought was fantastic about that is when I share them with my kids or uh, when I share them with a few friends, it, uh, a lot of the things they remember now, a lot of the events, I believe, you know, you had the, the death of Sayyida Khadija. Uh, all of that uh, key points in the life of the Prophet yes. ﷺ. Yes. Very well marked. And they, for the first time, they stuck with me. For the first yes. time, they stuck yes. with me. Which was, I thought yeah. was amazing, mashallah. Yeah. Can you, can you talk no, about I'm glad further? you brought that up. The, yeah. You know, I call it the Quran Your Timeline. The Quran Your Timeline is in the very beginning of my book. Um, and uh, yeah, it's the thing that, that of the entire, all the, you know, seven different, 10 different unique parts of my book, that's the thing that everyone takes away the most. And it's like the most life changing for them. And this is for people who know the Sira inside out, because to me, it's far more important, like for my own children, I would far rather than understand the big picture of the Sira than to know all the details and be able to quote Hadith but they could never put the whole life map of the prophet peace upon them together. And that's what I see when I talk to most people. I hate to say that, but I'm just going to be honest. So of the Muslim community, I would say 95% of them don't know the prophet peace upon more than two things. If you ask them who, uh, you know, who was his second wife or wore the names of his four daughters, they most 90% of Muslims, I would say can't give you all four. So that's unfortunately where we're at. The good news is that we have a lot of growth, to do and a lot of opportunity to get really connected to him. Uh, it would be much more disheartening if everyone knew the Prophet peace be upon him and our Ummah is in this condition. So Alhamdulillah, it means we just need to connect to the Prophet peace be upon him. Of the 5% who know him really well, even when I encounter them, I just feel like a lot of them know so many details, but they're not able to put the whole thing together in a way that they can present it to other people, that they can understand the point of the message. Mm -hmm. They'll just be like, you know, in this moment at, you know, at Badr, there were this many people and the army was over here. And it's like, well, that's not, that's okay. But the real story of Badr is about at some point in your life, you're going to get a lot of tests because at some point in life, you're going to have your Badr moment where you're either in this or you're not in this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say the Badr moment was the Red Sea moment for the prophet. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at Musa alayhi salam, no other prophet is more scared than Musa. Throughout the Quran, throughout the Taha, Musa alayhi salam gets scared. Allah says, la takhaf. Then Musa alayhi salam gets scared. Then Allah says, don't get scared. And Musa is like the, the most powerful of the prophets. He's the one with the staff. He's like Sayyidina Umar. Or Sayyidina Umar is like Musa alayhi salam. And yet Allah is saying, he's getting scared. Don't be scared. He's getting scared. Don't get scared. Why? Because when it comes to the Red Sea, he doesn't get scared there. So Allah is teaching us a story of Musa alayhi salam. In the same way, that's more important than whoa, how big was his stick, where was the Red Sea. What's more important is that you see a journey of a man. A man, just a man, not a, not a superhero. A man who overcomes fear so that when he has his Red Sea moment, he does the thing. And that's what you see in the Prophet Muhammad. When he has his Badr moment, he does the thing. To me, that is big. And that's why the Quran, your timeline for me, honestly, for most people, I tell them, you know, I have a lot of friends who come up to me. Oh, you know, I don't have time to read the book. It's this, I'm busy. I said, look, just know the Quran, your timeline. Understand the themes of his life, the challenges, the hardships, 
and the pattern of his life. Take that pattern, make it your pattern in life. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know how many people came to Ahad. You don't need to know what the name of this, this, uh, this person, whatever. All you need to know is how to map your life onto the life of the Prophet Muhammad. These are big themes. You want to go into more details? Do it. It'll make it more powerful. But just stick to the big story. If you know that, inshallah, it's impossible not to be changed by him. Unfortunately, we have this culture nowadays, which I'm really fighting against, that everyone has to be a scholar. And it's a very unfortunate situation. I don't know why that's, I think that's why that's happens because a lot of people who speak are scholars. And so they feel like you have to learn this and you have to learn the, you know, the perfect Arabic and then you have to learn this. And then there, here's a Hadith class for you. And then, and then, you know, and what that's done is it's created a community where everyone is feeling like if I, either I'm a scholar or I'm nothing. But when you look at the companions, they weren't really scholars. They weren't. There were not that many hafaz at the life of the Prophet. Very few companions actually memorized the entire Quran. Sayyidina Abu Bakr did not memorize the entire Quran. This was mind-blowing for me when I heard this. What? He was not a hafaz of the Quran? I thought every companion was a hafiz because that's how it's, we feel. If, we're, if not a hafiz, we, who are we to give a khutbah? They weren't a hafiz of the Quran. They were tra traders, farmers, merchants, but they were, connect they were connected to the Prophet. And so that's what I'm about, is take away the big picture. Don't worry about the details unless you're passionate about them. But if you don't have the big picture, you're kind of wasting your time just learning details and not. And so that's why I think the Quran your timeline has been very, has resonated with a lot of people is because it gives them the big picture finally in a way they can remember it, they can think about it, they can see it. I mean, I know five-year-olds and six-year-olds who can teach the Quran your timeline to their parents and I will, I will tell you that that five-year-old knows more about the Prophet Muhammad Pizam than 90% of Muslim adults out there. Uh, the, no, this, is, uh, the, 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 this makes a lot of sense to me and really emulating the life of the Prophet and w loving him and applying what he taught us in our lives. Having this light mm -hmm. is, I, I, I think, the key. I want to share the link for your book with everyone just in case. Um, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paste it uh, in the chat. For everyone, again, fantastic book, must read uh, for Dr. Miraj. You, you have to kind of um, get a copy of that book. Inshallah, today we're going to give at the end of the webinar also, uh, uh, we have a giveaway. I uh, pasted the link earlier. I'm going to go ahead and also paste that link again for the uh, giveaway. If you want to get a copy for this book, Inshallah, you can um, go ahead and, and uh, do that. Uh, Dr. Miraj, you mentioned uh, something very important. We, as you know, Iqra has uh, over 1,500 uh, students across the world, mm -hmm. over 46 countries, really. And my question to you is, how can, we, uh, how can our teachers really instill uh, uh, um, uh, some of the kind of characteristics uh, mm -hmm. of Prophet Muhammad, some, apply some of those principles to their classes? Any, any ideas? Yeah. We have over 1,500 families uh, over 64 countries across the world. So yeah, how can we help yeah. them out in that re respect? What would you expect from the teacher? So again, I'm, when I'm going back to what I was saying earlier, the most important thing, I mean, and, and I, I would hope that teachers know this, but I've seen a lot of teachers who don't know this, not in Iqra network, but in my own experiences, even my own child, I pulled them out of the masjid uh, uh, classes because I was not happy because what people are forgetting over and over again is that the teacher is, for, for all practical purposes, the teacher is Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, to the child, psychologically. And if you are not in yourself at some level of, uh, if you don't have some level of his, divine, of his attributes, you're not representing the Prophet. You're doing a really, you're doing a huge disservice to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And you know, I, I've taught at Islamic schools and so forth. And I, I, after you know some experiences, I've said it is better to not teach people about the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him than to teach them in a way that will damage their psyche about the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Like I would rather kids just be clueless and be like I don't know who's Muhammad. I would rather that for our children than to be like. Oh, I remember that class on Sira or that Quran teacher who was always yelling. He was on his phone. He was, you know, um, I just felt un uncomfortable. I dreaded going to class. He was always like, you know, Hamza, 
how many times did I tell you you're never going to learn and just stern that is more damaging because that child you've now decreased their chance to ever coming back to the problem because now not only do they have to have an interest in them, they have to work through all the psychological damage the trauma that they had around the problem system. and so that's why I tell people you know forget about even like the 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 pedagogy of how to teach I'm just saying how to be is so much more important I, I, again, and I was telling you this, you know, I would rather my child be with a teacher. Uh, the more, the biggest reason why I have my son call in every day uh, with our teacher who I absolutely love. And I don't know if you guys have picked the winners yet, but he should be the winner inshallah <laughs> is because um, of how he is. He smiles. He plays with my son. He asks him how his day went. The prophet peace upon him did the same thing with mm-hmm. that boy whose bird died. He, he, he lifted children up. That's so, I'll teach, you know, inshallah, I plan to teach my child sirah. I plan to teach my child Quran because it's my responsibility as a parent. It's just that I have to go to work. And so I want my son's day to start off with another person who is also trying to be prophetic in his, in his nature. That's so much more important to me than all the reading and the recitation and the Quran. That's important too. But who he is, is, is key. So, you know, I'll just leave it at that because I think that's just, you know, for our teachers, how you are with children will forever change uh, who they are and their relationship with Islam and the Quran. And one small yell, one small misslip mm-hmm. can have a lasting impression on children and it can push them away forever. And so I think that I would just leave it at that for, for, um, for the moment right now. So I like, yeah, I, I I'll just... This. Yeah, I, I love the term that you mentioned, lift them up, really, which is kind of, uh, re- really, it sums it up really well. Well, I mean, if you look at, and this is one thing that, you know, in my own journey, I, I've discovered many things. And one of the things that I discovered, and, you know, I didn't get, we didn't get into all this because we have limited time, but I never set out to learn the Prophet Muhammad because I wanted to know the Prophet Muhammad. That wasn't the reason why I started my whole journey. My reason is I want to connect to the Quran. That's what I wanted. Hmm. I just realized I struggled so hard to connect with the Quran because it's like Surah Fatah and then you get into Surah Al-Baqarah and it's like overwhelming, it's stressful. I don't know all the stories and the relevance. And I struggled so much with the Quran for, you know, 25 years. I stopped and then I said, how did the best companions learn Quran? They didn't learn. They never studied Quran. They just hung out with the Prophet, peace be upon him. I call it a, the ABC plan, the Abu Bakr coaching plan. Say, Abu Bakr, just say, just put the Quran down. Just hang out with the Prophet. When he gets revelation, he'll tell you about it in chronological order. And when you look at the Quran in chronological order, the first third of the Quran is just tarbiya, as Rahma, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Wa Duha, Wa Layli, Saja, right? Yusra. It's about Rahma, about love, about tarbiya. So Allah is using the same coaching plan. Allah is. Our Rabb, capital R, we are our children's lowercase Rabb. Why should we not take the divine plan, the divine teaching plan of how to be towards those who are dependents is to start with Rahmah. And the Quran starts with Rahmah. Sharia is just in the Medinan period and so little of it. The Quran, so little of the Quran is about what you should do and what you should not do. And so much of the Quran is loving Allah and having a relationship with him. And yet we make it the opposite. We say to our children, we don't follow the divine plan of teaching and tarbiyah. We put ta'lim before tarbiyah. Our kids are uh, too much. All Islam is things I can't do. And my dad's always mad when he comes home and grumpy from work. Well, then that's what you're teaching. That's the prophet's example for them. And so I say you follow the Quranic recipe, which is you do the Meccan period first and the tarbiyah, the rahma, and all that stuff. And then you do ta'lim later, teaching them about the importance, the fiqh and the sharia. That's such a small part of Islam. The biggest part of Islam is what's in your heart, right? And so that's, that's kind of been always been my approach. And I think uh, Iqra Network, that's why I love you guys. I'm very careful about who I expose my children to when it comes to Islam, because I don't want someone to ruin it for my children, because then you have to undo all this trauma. And, you know, Iqra Network is one of those few places, uh, and specifically with our teacher, Sheikh Yusuf, where I, I, I love him, like from my heart. And I love you guys, because you guys are able to give that tarbiya in a way that, you know, when I'm not there, I can't give. And it's also important that my son gets it, not just from me and my, his mother, that he sees that, the, oh, there's a whole community of people who love the Prophet. This is not just my interpretation. No, this is Sheikh Yusuf's interpretation. This is uh, uh, Fahad's interpretation. We all agree that we love the Prophet, Allah in this way, so. 
these are gems, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohideen. I mean, I hope all teachers and parents take it to heart and apply it in their homes, really. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Mohideen, uh, one quick question. What are you working yes. on now? You mentioned uh, uh, you had this incident last week. What are you working on? I'm really curious to know. Yeah, so I am really, really excited. I'm actually more excited now about my project than I did writing Revelation, because I think this, inshallah, I hope and I pray um, uh, that this has a greater impact for more people and a deeper impact. And so what I'm working on right now is I just recently, this Ramadan, uh, this past Ramadan, I started a YouTube channel, The Revelation Experience. And what I am doing is I recognize most people don't read, they don't have time to read or they're out of practice reading and so forth. And so I've started a podcast, it's on YouTube, it'll very soon be on iTunes and you know Google Play and all that kind of stuff, where I um, walk people, for those of you who don't wanna read, I will walk you through the entire Sira, just like this, you're listening to me right now, same voice, very low key, casual, but powerful. And my emphasis is always on why is this important for you as a parent or as an adult? What does this have to do with your life? I'm not teaching you to memorize things. I'm teaching you to make a difference in your life so you feel committed and then you be that person for your children or for your family and so forth. So that's the first uh, product that I'm working on right now. Uh, we have already gone through all the way the first six years of the 23 years of the, the Quran year timeline and it's Sira with Quran at the same time. I'm not one of these people like, oh, read Sirah, then finish that, don't go read Quran, because that's not how it happened for the companions. Sirah happened with Quran at the same time. It was all Meccan period first, then Medinan period. So I'm very chronologically based. I think that's the most powerful way to approach it. That's my opinion after looking at different ways. But the big thing beyond that is I'm actually creating all of these courses that I'm going to be putting out, inshallah, in the next few months on just like this, you're actually in my studio right now. I'm using a camera in my studio. So this is exactly the setup. And I teach Sira high level, not like getting into the details of it. If you want the details, you can buy the book. But I don't need everyone to buy the book. People can't afford it, shipping, all that stuff. Don't worry about it. Inshallah, I'm putting out all of these courses to connect people to the high level points of the Sira so that they can become the person they were always meant to be. You and I, alhamdulillah, we were supposed to be you know, in the Quran, it says, uh, I think, in, you'll have to help me here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we created men in the best of forms, right? Asfala safilin, right? We created in the best of forms, except for those who go down. Naturally, we're like an airplane. We created you to fly. But if you don't yep. give energy, you will fall to the ground. But yep. if you use the engine and you fight the resistance, resistance is good in life, right? Allah says life is difficult, right? It's a surah al-balad. Life is difficult. Yep. Embrace it, embrace the resistance and you will go higher. And so revelation is about lifting you up, not about making you heavy with weary with details. I'm not making, I'm not interested in scholars. I'm not a scholar. I'm interested in making just the general Muslim feel alive, alive by the Quran, alive by the example of the prophet. So that's what I'm working on right now. And if you're interested in that, um, I put, I think in the comments here, just for the revelation experience, you can just Google that YouTube, it will show up. You can see there are over 60 episodes already out right now. And if you um, just go to the Re revelation, the book.com, you already put that thing there. Just subscribe to that. I'll keep you on the email list and I'll give you all the announcements of when it's coming out. It's all for you to have uh, inshallah. So you can make a difference for your life, for your, your, your families. We'll definitely uh, look forward to it. Dr. Milaj, inshallah. Uh, and hopefully when you have, uh, when it's out there, um, so let us know and we'll definitely share it with our audience as well. Absolutely. Thank you. No, thanks for having me here too. I really um, appreciate it. So, so, so a, a few final questions that I have. Sure. So one of them, one of them is, as you, you know, um, kids develop different interests in households and uh, you're an award-winning author, mashallah. You wrote a book, great book. And so my question for you, for young uh, Muslim writers, aspiring light, writers, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for, I, I know my kids, some of them like, write, like writing, and yeah. what, what advice do you have for them? And what kind of topics would you encourage them to explore? As a writer? Yes. You're saying? Yes. Uh, as a, well, as a Muslim I think, writer. Do yeah. you have any specific uh, topics? Do you, so the uh, reality is, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, it's funny is that I, I was never a writer before I wrote this book. I didn't, I wasn't, that wasn't my, I never enjoyed writing. Uh, <laughs> that sounds silly. I was never like a reader or a writer uh, until I started writing my book. And then I started reading a lot. 
Uh, my brother, who's actually a published poet, is actually the writer in our family. So he's really the writer. But um, I, I think, uh, you know, helping your children find their passion is very important and guiding them through that passion. Uh, because not everyone has a natural inclination to share their mastery. You know, some people like to perform their mastery or some people like to do just create in the background. And I think, you know, the bigger picture right now, uh, you know, in terms of writing itself, you know, we have to, as a Muslim community, embrace reading and writing because that is what our foundation, our, our deen is based on. You know, I, I, a lot of people shrug off Surah Al-Alaq, but Surah Al-Alaq is very specifically read. We can't be like, oh, I'm not a reader. I don't like to read. No, well, then you're not, you know, that's not, <laughs> the, the Quran is telling you you need to read get to like reading them. And so I think for us as a community, again, it's all by example. My kids know I write, you know, if I'm reading in the house, they see that reading is normal. If no one's reading and it's always just, you know, Netflix, they're not going to become writers and readers unless they have some very powerful instinct. So again, as lead by example, if you're writing and reading, you know, you know, my wife does these great, uh, projects where she does uh, kind of like little book reports. If they go on a walk and they see a snail, she'll come back and let's go explore about snails and do a drawing and let's do a book report on snails. And, and she does it too with them. So I think that's so important, right? You have to explore the world through the eyes of your child. You do the project with them. My son loves to come into the studio. I've taped him doing an episode talking about stuff. So we're just encouraging kids and they're in our world. We're not like teacher student, like, you know, one's up here and one's down here. You kind of got to go into the kid's world and play with them and, and show them that it's fun. And, you know, again, everything is by example. So. Yeah, uh, so sounds great. I think uh, everyone should try and practice that in their home. Um, uh, Dr. Miraj, again, one important question. You're a Harvard physician and that says a lot. And I'm sure many of the families that are here, uh, they'd love for their kids to attend the best schools. Uh, do you have a word for them? Um, <laughs> well, <it's laughs> like, uh, I guess I'll say this in my own journey, you know, I, I, I reflected a lot on my own journey and specifically because of having children, you know, having children makes you, forces you to really start looking at your life critically and be like, what do I want my kids to take from my experience and what, do, what can I improve for them? Just like my parents did for me. They gave me something that they didn't have. I'm looking at what my parents did for me in my own life journey. Like, how can I use the best of that and then make the stuff that can be improved even better? I actually think, and I don't know if this is unexpected as an answer, so one thing I've definitely found is it's, it's not as important where you go to school. Okay. Um, the people who make it a big deal are people who have insecurities about their own resume and like, Oh, I went here and I went here. And they, the best people often who I work with did went to, to the local schools. Okay. Now there's a certain balance of like, if it's too small or if it's not competitive enough, you won't get the education you want. But after a certain level, like most state universities, have everything that the Harvards and the Stanfords have. There's very little that Harvard and Stanford have that the, they probably have more. The school that I go to right here down the street is the biggest university in the entire country. They have more resources than Harvard will ever have. And I am moving to a place now in my own thinking about my own children. I don't think it's gonna be hard. I don't think, see the challenge in my time might have been, oh, can you get into Stanford, for example? Uh, and I think the challenge right now for parents and where I'm right now is how can I get my kid to hold on to their dean in this time and be accomplished as a person, but first hold on to their dean. And I, to be totally candid with you, where I'm at right now, and I have a lot of time to think about this and talk to my friends and see the experiences of, of uh, other children who are older than my child, I'm actually far more interested in keeping my child close to me and go to a good university where they can grow to wherever they want to be, but have a very strong uh, connection to Allah and the Prophet than to go far away and have this great resume. But in that process, they fell away from things. And I think, especially in this time and age, we didn't have internet when I was, when I was in college, internet was just coming out, email was just coming out. But the real challenges of growing up as a child in this day and age will be, uh, and I'll just be very blunt because parents need to hear this, pornography, mm -hmm. what's on the internet, what is pulling your sons and daughters away from the dean? 
atheism, apathy. These are the biggest dangers to me. I'm, I'm very aware of this. And to me, that's more important to me than will the child go to Indiana University or to Stanford or to Alabama State or to UCLA is will my child have apathy towards Islam? Will they be turned away? There's drugs out there. The marketing, the internet, everything is constant. And so for me personally, that's my answer. I've, you know, I've thought about this a lot. I'm constantly trying to evolve my own thinking, talking to people and so forth. But to me, uh, I just, I think this whole name brand thing, that age is over. I've seen so many people, I've seen so many friends and people I know who've gone to the best schools, but they don't talk to their parents that much anymore. They're not that connected to the deen anymore. And then I've seen so many people, my, my Quran teacher myself, I would love for my son to become like my Quran teacher locally, not, I mean, not with the Quran network, you know, my own personal teacher. And he went to the state school here. Yep. But, you know, he's a hafiz of the Quran, he's a qari, his father is an imam. And I, I don't need all that stuff. I don't need him to be a hafiz, or the, but he's connected to the masjid. And he knows that he wants to be close to his parents and to take care of his parents. And to me, the, I'm, in this day and age, I actually am putting more of an emphasis on that because I think the dangers are far greater to be pulled away from the deen than they were when I was a college student. So, you know, that's where I'm at right now. And, you know, we can... You know, it's an evolving idea, but I just think that the whole idea of Harvard, Stanford, MIT, yep. doctor, lawyer, yep. that's that there's so many pitfalls in that. Uh, there's so many people who have these busy lives right now and do not have an opportunity to be prophetic to their children because it's a doctor married to a doctor. And now you have COVID and now there's no one to take care of the kids. And now the kids, you know, and it's, it's tough. I know. And, you know, we're all dealing with these realities, but that promise of everything and the money and all that, they're very dark realities to that, that you have to be aware of. And, uh, you know, when it comes to careers and money and the pursuit of, you know, professional excellence, it comes at certain pinfalls. And I think when you know the prophet Muhammad peace upon him and you want to be like him, then you say, wait a second, the prophet Muhammad peace upon him said, split your day into thirds. And I talk about this with my brother all the time. If I'm working 80 hours a week, I'm not following the prophetic coaching plan. Because yep. that's not a third. My work is taking up, you know, two thirds of my life. Now I have to fit in one third, I have to fit my family and my children and my dean. And then I wonder why I'm not getting results the coach was telling me because I'm not following his example. And unfortunately in our world today, the corporate world, the medical world, this kind of stuff, they are not telling you to follow the prophetic model. And then that's why we see families, you know, everyone's getting divorced and kids are suffering and all this kind of stuff because we don't follow the prophetic model. We follow the, 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 the popular model. And this is where Sira becomes important, Sunnah so becomes important, because we have struggling families with successful parents. And then it's like, well, what was the, is that worth it? You yeah. Know, and we, we have I to mean, start asking these difficult questions. Yeah, they, I mean, these are all wonderful points. I think um, keeping the balance, maintaining balance in life is so important. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, Allah tadhu fil mizan, that everything has to be balanced. And I, I, I totally agree with you. In my own experience, also, as you said, uh, sometimes individuals who are not coming from such great schools, they end up uh, outperforming others who graduated from uh, uh, a much, much uh, kind of Ivy League school. So, yes. so, some, uh, so it, it's true, you make your future and, and having a balanced life is so important. One thing that you mentioned about, again, the coach, the course that you're making or the uh, podcast that you're making, there's really, I feel there's a need for this coaching. Uh, yeah. and Muslims in America, in the West, yes. even yes. across the world, there's so much need for coaching. And I hope yes. that your, cor uh, your course, what, uh, the program that you're coming up with, comes out yeah. very soon because it's uh, really Thank there's you. a need. And I would be uh, your first student in that. I course. appreciate That's that. No, I appreciate that. I, I agree with you. I think what I'm learning now is the age of information is dying now. There's too much information out there. Even myself, I'll be totally honest with you. If, I, if someone comes out with another 100 episode series on Sira, I can't watch it. I'm so overwhelmed with information. We are now moving into the age of transformation. People are like, I don't want more information. Just tell me, how do I get from A to B? How do I become this person? And tell me what I need to do. And let's keep it simple. And that's what Revelation the Experience is about, is how do I get from A to B? And I'm also moving, I'm not at B, I'm also moving along that journey. We're always moving along that journey. But I think we are moving into the age of transformation. And that's what the Prophet peace be upon him was, is he was, a, he was a, someone who transformed people. He didn't, he didn't lecture people and sit down with them and this is the rule of this. He was a transformer. 
And when you look at all the companions, there were companions who, who barely knew the Quran because they came into it very late, but they became the great, greatest heroes. Like some, you know, we talk about Khalid bin Walid, uh, and all these people, they barely knew the Quran. They fought against the Prophet most of their lives, alayhi yeah. salam, and yet they were transformed. They weren't informed, they were transformed. Yeah. And that's what, you know, Revelation, the experience is all about. And my book and my mission is to be transformed. They're better, more qualified teachers to give information. I'm in the business of helping people transform. And that's coaching, like you said. Coaching means helping someone move. Let's talk about what are your pitfalls? Why are you struggling with this? Oh, you had, a, you had an abusive relationship with your Quran teacher when you were a child? Let's get into that because that's what's holding you back. Let's transform. Let's not just tell me, let me just tell you more and lecture you. That's inform. And so, inshallah, I hope, and thank you for your kind words. I hope, inshallah, there can be, uh, there can be benefit to people with, with transformation. You know? So that's kind of the goal. Inshallah, inshallah, and I'm hopeful that inshallah we'll announce about, about that program uh, uh, to our newsletter. Uh, we have over maybe 20,000 uh, individuals subscribed to our newsletter. I think it's very important to uh, um, get involved in such programs. Uh, if there are any questions, we're going to have like five extra minutes at the end. Please uh, just type in your questions now for uh, Dr. Miraj. Um, Dr. Miraj, I want to thank you today, really. This is truly, truly inspiring. Um, uh, I, I want to hear from you. Is there any final words that you want to share with our audience today on Facebook here? Um, uh, any final words that you would like them to, 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 to hear from you? No, I, first of all, thank you so much for being so gracious with me uh, with what happened last week uh, and having to postpone the meeting. And thank you for everyone who listened. I know it's a you know a Saturday afternoon. It's hard to do another Zoom call for those of you who were able to attend. I really appreciate you listening. And um, you know, I just I will just the the only thing I can say is remember that the Prophet Islam came as a person giving glad tidings, right? Mubashir, right? We should be happy with this deen. We should be, feel excited. You know, we get excited on Eid. Every day should be Eid for us. If we truly understand how much Allah loves us, if we truly understand how special we are to Allah, you know, we would be smiling all the time. The Prophet didn't smile because he, he was doing a PR stunt to get people. He was smiling because he, 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 he understood how special every, the most wretched person was to Allah. And I think if we embrace this, this time that we are living in right now, in the 21st century. Now you take COVID and throw it on top of that. People are really struggling in the world right now. People are so depressed, so disconnected. Uh, not Muslims, every humanity. Uh, disconnected, upset, uh, elders are locked away right now. Their children don't speak to them anymore. You know, uh, Children are disconnected from their parents. It's a very difficult time. There's a huge fitna that we are going through right now in this age and era. And it is my firmest belief and conviction that the only solution to the difficulties of modernity is Islam. And we have an opportunity to give to humanity, not Muslims. We have to stop thinking about, oh, my Muslim community, my non-Muslim community. We have to be prophetic and be like, Ya Allah, humanity is suffering. We are suffering. Give me nur so I can give light to people. Like lovingly, Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Hindu, anything, your enemies, be a, a source of nur because people are really struggling. The lay people, we look at, you know, these diff horrible, you know, people, you know, if we look at India and Syria and we look at leaders and we say, oh, these people, oh, the people who live there are regular people who are suffering with depression, anxiety, financial burden. Let's, you know, let's, inshallah, let's embrace the message. Let's smile and remember that the Prophet, peace be upon him, came as a rahmah and we should be happy. Allah, lo he loves us. He is rooting for us and he's bringing us to any difficulty. It's because he's, he's pulling us to him. And so if we, inshallah, if we have that, that, you know, that sense, we can be powerful. Our smile and our way of being is way more powerful than anything that we can say. And so uh, I'll just end with that because I feel like so many talks are always stern and rough and this and that. And this is, this is, this is a, a path of beauty and of ease and happiness. And so uh, there's no fear, there's no grief for those of you who follow my guidance. And so we have to go back to that, a, a place of no, uh, no, no hope, no husn, a place of happiness. And so, uh, you know, inshallah, you know, make, uh, I, I pray that Allah gives Iqra Network huge success around the world because what you guys have done has been incredible. 
in matching needs with you know supply and demand and and creating solutions has just been so powerful for me and for our family and i, I just make dua that you guys grow and grow and grow and provide this this newer to 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 all of humanity inshallah i mean inshallah for everyone Jazakallah uh, khair, uh, Dr. Muhyiddin. This has been fantastic. Uh, just for the audience, I'll, I'm going to announce the winner. We picked the winner uh, of the book giveaway. Uh, the winner is uh, Taifur Wahid from Buffalo, uh, New York. Inshallah, uh, you will receive an email from us, and we will uh, we do have your address. So we're going to send uh, you a copy of uh, Dr. Miraj's book, Revelation: The Story of Muhammad. I encourage the rest, go check out the book. It's a fantastic book. Uh, it's really a must read. Uh, Dr. Muhyiddin, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. Of course, thank you. Thank I, pray you. To Allah. Course. I pray to Allah that he blesses you, blesses your family. And All of us. I, Amen. Amen. Take that uh, journey uh, 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 about uh, Prophet Muhammad, a success, and instill Amen. the love of Prophet Muhammad in everyone's heart, inshallah. Muslim Amen. and non-Muslim. Jazakallah uh, khair, brother uh, Miraj. And thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Thank for you. Your time. Thank you, Fahad. And thank everyone at Iqra Network and the entire community. I really appreciate this. Thanks so much. And thank you for our, uh, our audience. Inshallah, we'll see you next time. Uh, inshallah, you'll hear more from uh, Dr. Miraj. Inshallah, we're gonna, uh, he's going to be, inshallah, in our newsletter many times, inshallah, from now on. Inshallah. Jazakallah Thank you, Fahad. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.